uh, so the announcements, uh, you know, uh, one is that I'm going to be on the road for the next couple weeks. And so the next uh, um, uh, lecture will probably be next Sunday. OK, and I'm going to do my best to be here on Sunday and um, I, on this channel. I mean, not here in Frankfurt, I'll probably be somewhere else. Uh, the other one is that Hans, my son, he is coming at the end of the month. He uh, was sent on a secret mission, <laughs> a damsel in distress that he rescued, I guess, <laughs> or is about to rescue. And uh, so I'm uh, happy to get him back in at the beginning of June, probably. And then for those of you who asked about the lawsuit, yeah, we're in court now, and uh, we're suing these mathematical biophysicists, okay? And um, uh, yeah, we're, we're in court. We're probably going to be there for a while. And uh, the issue there is that these people, these uh, uh, biophysicists, they copied uh, not only the rope model and started to make money with it, but they also copied the definitions, something we're going to talk about today. And, you know, those definitions are... Uh, copyrighted in the uh, Why God Doesn't Exist, the uh, first book I wrote on the subject. And, uh, you know, if you want to follow up on the, uh, on the lawsuit itself, on the case, I uh, posted a thread on the Rational Scientific Method in, in Facebook, so you can find it there, okay? And so, yeah, those interested can, uh, in the subject can, you know, uh, go to that Rational Scientific Method and they'll find out more about it. Okay, um, so what is it that you know that I'm defending in that in that lawsuit and also here because you know I, I talk about this quite often and which is also the subject of today uh, in great measure and these are the words uh, what I put in that book were the foundations of physics you cannot do physics unless you define these words at least these words there's some more but these I guess are the main ones and so yes you need to define these words in order to give a physical interpretation to uh, a phenomenon okay and uh, the main one is that word there, the word object. And uh, like I say, the definition of the word object destroys all religions. Once you define the word object, all religions have to go. All religions are based on spirits, on concepts, and we can't use those to uh, give a physical interpretation to any phenomenon. And so that's the key issue. Okay? Um, here, um, here we have, uh, give me a second here. Here's the pictorial representation of those words, okay? You have the uh, object, which is that which has shape there. You have a cat and a dog, those have shape. Distance separation between objects. Uh, location is the set of distances from one object to all the rest. And that also plays into the word exist because in order for you to exist, you have to have location. You have to be an object and you have to have location, meaning you have to have a set of distances with all objects in the universe. If God wants to exist, all he's got to do is meet the definition of the word exist. And then he exists by definition, period. Okay, it's got nothing to do with belief or anything else. Um, emotion, it's two or more locations of one object. Okay, so if you take two or more steps, you've, uh, you have uh, essentially uh, motion. And time, we don't use the word time in science, but we define it for the mathematicians so they know what they've been talking about these last 2,500 years. And time is this uh, comparison of two motions, and it requires memory. What is space? Well, space is the opposite of an object, okay? A thing is the opposite of nothing, and uh, space is that which doesn't have shape. It's exactly the opposite of an object. So we have these definitions, and once you have those definitions, you are able to communicate your theory to another human being in a rational manner, so they can follow, you know, your arguments, your theory, okay? your explanation. Okay, uh, what are the forbidden words? Words that we cannot use in physics. Uh, these are used in mathematics, as we call it, a religion that attempts to merge physics with mathematics. An impossible task. It's impossible. You can't, math has nothing to do with physics. Physics has nothing to do with math. But these people are called mathematical physicists, and we call them mathematicians because they end up doing everything by magic. What is magic? Black magic? The movement of concepts. It's okay to move, you know, spirits because you can at least, <laughs> or a ghost because, I mean, if you paint it like Casper the Friendly Ghost, at least you can see something. You say, well, it's this uh, flying, uh, you know, bed sheet. Okay, with, with two eyes and a, nose <laughs> and a mouth. So we can all deal with the bed sheets because we say, okay, that's the spirit. Okay, fine. It's got superpowers, goes through walls, etc. No problem there. But when you start moving concepts around, Ooh, that's scary. I mean, uh, you need a lot of beers in order to do that. 
you know, when you start moving intelligence around and love and, you know, uh, energy and, you know, fields, then, you know, you're in trouble. And so some of these words uh, are not allowed in physics. Okay. And they're widely used in mathematics and people learned them by road in high school, you know, in uh, uh, the monasteries. Okay. As we say, okay. And here they are. These are some of the ones that are forbidden. Okay. It's uh, words like energy, field, time, wave and mass, plasma. Uh, you have the people at the uh, Electric Universe, they're fanatics of the word plasma. A lot of them also uh, adhere to the ether, okay? Charge, you know, what is charge? Force, they use force as a physical object. They said the force, may the force go with you. <laughs> Orbital, they treat as a physical object. Infinity, they think that infinity is something. So they say, oh, I went to infinity, like, you know, over there. <laughs> The vortex, another famous words of, uh, of the electric universe. A lot of them like the word vortex. They think it's uh, this tornado is a thing. Okay, Point, line, and obviously we do not use numbers in science. Not at all. Not one bit. Anyone doing math has nothing to do with science or with physics. We have no use for numbers. Okay, And so we typically call them idiots. An idiot is an individual with very, very big ideas. It comes from the middle Klingon, meaning big idea, okay, like idiot, okay, it's not just a little idea, it's an idiot, okay, so we call them idiots. Uh, yeah, none of those words are allowed in science, none of those words are allowed in physics, and they're not allowed because, first of all, they're quantitative, meaning they're going to describe, and we have no use for description. Science is interested in explanations, that's where you have to break your brain. And no, uh, explanations are not uh, made of descriptions, okay? We have a different issue with explanation. I've discussed it in the past, and there's also a video out there, so you can look it up. Anyways, um, uh, the other thing that we don't uh, use are some of the um, activities that they do in mathematics. A lot of people think that these activities are pertinent to physics. They're not, okay? And here they are. These are the forbidden activities and processes. Uh, we don't count. We have no use for counting, okay? Uh, number, you know, no, no use for that at all. We do not do predictions. That's astrology, palm reading, and who knows what, but certainly not part of science. We have no use for predictions. We do not observe. We do not gawk, okay? You can observe all day and not understand anything, so observation is not part of science or of physics. And we always remove the witness. We do it mafia style. We kill the witness. And that's part of the problem with observe that a lot of people say, I observed in the lab. Well, you know, uh, maybe you just inferred, thinking that you observed. And uh, we don't measure anything. We have no use for measurement. We have no use for experiments. Okay? You can do all the experiments you want at home in your own basement. Okay? And when you come to conference, we want you to explain what you understood, what you got out of it. But to do an experiment, we, we don't allow you to do experiments at the conference, okay? Like uh, Michael Faraday used to do experiments in front of people with magnets and electricity and so on. That's not science, that's uh, voodoo. <laughs> that's magic, <laughs> magician. We do not falsify. Uh, it's it's uh, really illegal to falsify things as far as I know, you know? So we do not falsify anything. They say that in mathematics that they falsify theories. We have no idea what that is, especially when falsify means that it's your opinion. And opinions belong to religion. So whenever you falsify or or uh, truthify, you convert something, prove and turn something into truth. Uh, none of that has anything to do with science. That's got to do with your beliefs and with religion. Uh, because we don't experiment, we don't test anything. We don't verify anything. You know, we don't verify. You can verify all of, all of what you want at home in your own dark basement. But in science, we do not verify anything because that has to do again with belief. We do not prove. We do not use. Use has to do with technology. Okay? And science is different with techno than technology. A lot of people confuse the, the, the notions of technology with science. They think it's the same. In fact, uh, you'll find many of the headings like in YouTube and so on, they say science and technology. And so a lot of people, uh, you know, confuse these. Authorized. We have no authorities in, uh, in uh, science, in physics. No one is an authority. So if you got your PhD and you say, well, I got authority because, you know, I studied all this 10 years and now I got my PhD. It's worthless. Sorry, it has no value. You know, you, you could have studied divinity studies for all we know. <laughs> works. If it works or not, that's like use. You know, that's got to do with technology. We don't care if it works or not. We want to make sure that we understand the theory and that we can crunch it and, you know, um, figure out whether each individual has to figure out whether they like the theory or not. 
And we do not re do repeatable experiments again because, you know, it's nonsense again. You can repeat all you want the experiment. Uh, you know, throw the pencil as many times as you want until you figure out that it always falls to the floor. No problem there. When you come to the conference, we need for you to explain why, what causes that pencil to fall to the floor. We do not describe, we explain, and we do not vote for theories, okay? There is no voting, there's no uh, democracy in science, okay? You can believe whatever you want, okay? Voting, again, is an opinion. So you vote, you raise your hand and say, I vote for that theory. Great. You know, the other guy votes for another theory. <laughs> so what have we learned, you know? So we don't care about any of that. In science, we need to understand the theory. That's where science stops and religion begins, okay? Religion begins when you start giving opinions of what's uh, true or false, what's correct and incorrect. That's when we get into religion. And, that's, and people emphasize a lot of that and say, oh, I need evidence. I need proof. You're in the wrong place. Science doesn't offer evidence or proof. Science offers theory, explanations of mechanisms so that you understand it. Then you reach your own conclusion, you know, in private. That's your problem. Okay, that's the way it works. So how we, did we end up with all this, uh, these words of mathematics? Well, for that, we have to, even though you may not believe me, <laughs> we have to go to the Bible, you know. And the Bible, you know, was uh, given to man by God. Okay, here he is. This is when it happened. Okay, God gave the Bible to man, and in the Bible, you're going to find a, um, you're going to find a little story, and it's the story of uh, Babel, you know, the Tower of Babel, uh, and that's where babbling comes from, I think. Um, what happened was that uh, God, um, in his wise wisdom, he didn't want man to, you know, reach his uh, heaven. Uh, while he was alive, you know, while he after death, you know, maybe your soul goes to heaven. But when you're alive, we don't want you reaching to the heavens. Maybe they didn't. Maybe God didn't want anyone to see him in his knickers. I don't know, you know. And so the the issue is that apparently God has something against people building buildings to high levels. And so here you see a little bit of that story. Okay, uh, I'll set it in motion here, and you see how the tower, this tower is called the Tower of Babel, is uh, growing. And it grows all the way to, you know, to, uh, to the sky. And so God didn't like that. So what God did was he started to confuse people. You know, he, he started to create languages so they would not be able to. Uh, let me put myself back in here. Give me a second here. So they would not be able to talk to each other. And so that's how languages were created according to the Bible. The Bible is given by God. I mean, you know, you got to believe that, right? It's a fact. And so we have all these languages today. And, but what uh, a lot of people don't know is that it was the devil. The de that's not in the Bible, by the way. <laughs> so don't look it up. Uh, the devil is the one who created the definitions that he gave to the mathematicians. Okay? The devil was a mean critter, and he said, hey, sly guy, right? And he went in there, and he started uh, making all these definitions, putting them in dictionaries. Okay? And so what happened was people started reading these dictionaries, you know, and they walked around, they memorized a lot of the words that were in the dictionaries, and they created this language that nobody could understand because the guy who put them in there, who put those definitions in there, was the devil, okay? And so today what we have is uh, all this language created by the mathematicians who uh, created all this language that nobody understands, and here you see... This is where it all ended up with, you know, a lot of people get bored with all the language that the mathematicians use, and they just go out and get sick of all this stuff. <laughs> They're really, you know, uh, upset that the mathematicians use this language that nobody understands. And what they do actually is, uh, you know, they use all these fancy words, and we're, we're taught a lot of those by rote in high school, you know, like field and mass and so on. And, you know, a lot of people just drop out of the class and say, okay, thank God I'm, I'm over physics mathematical physics, and I'll never see it again. And so later on in life, all they do is they just listen to these guys. They don't understand anything of what they're saying because they're talking about fields and energy and mass and all this stuff. And they say, well, I don't understand any of that, but you look like you're intelligent, that you know what you're talking about. You got all those equations that nobody understands, so you must be right. And so these people can tell them, you know, that time is warped or that they shipped the field or that they transferred energy. And people say, okay, I think I understand you, you know, and that's, that's all the devil. So God was the fellow who created, you know, the, uh, the, the Bible. And he said, I want everybody to read it, but nobody read it. Even to this day, nobody reads it. Everybody checks the dictionary because whenever they don't know something, they say, well, go to the dictionary. Where do they go? They go to the ordinary dictionary. 
or to the ordinary encyclopedia, which essentially parrots the ordinary dictionary. And when they're there, it's the devil that takes over. He's the guy who put the words in there. He's the guy who's in charge of the dictionaries. A lot of people didn't know that. Okay, and so here it is. Okay, God is the author of the Bible, which no one reads anyway, right? And the devil is the creator of the definitions placed in dictionaries. That's how it all ended up. Okay, so I just wanted you to know the real story behind this. Okay, um, just so you know why we have all these all this language. See, God separated the languages, but within one language, you would have people who you know understood that language. So that's when the devil came in, put all these fancy words in there, very sly, devious words that you know people use to communicate, thinking they're communicating when they're not. Okay, and of course, one of those words is the word exist okay that we're going to be dealing with today and we're going to start with this fellow and he essentially shows that yeah the devil put this word in the dictionary okay and didn't define it people think they have a definition they don't and this is it you see it here uh an example again yeah referring to me he says he uses the definition of atheist which is proclaimed by theists and by atheists themselves N not by atheists themselves okay and he says atheism is an absence of belief in the evidence of deity okay but then he says I don't believe is different from I believe <laughs> is it and another fellow I think he he had the right answer okay and that's the answer the correct answer as far as I'm concerned okay you believe that no God exists but uh, become uh, scientifically hypocritical by calling it disbelief absolutely <laughs> is this belief a form of belief or not uh-huh I think he hit it right on the note this is exactly the thought that I had when I saw that and I read this fellow's comment. I said, I'm going to put that one up there. Okay, and so here it is. This is my uh, five cents worth on this, okay? And that's the absence of belief is or equal to disbelief. It's the same thing as belief. It's just a different type of belief. Uh, not belief does not make it an antonym. A not belief is just another belief, okay? And uh, non belief is just an opinion, again, and that's religion. Religion, the definition of religion is opinion, belief, okay? That's what it is. It's not God, it's not Jesus Christ or Mohammed. It's opinion and it's belief. And uh, belief plays no role in science. So whenever an atheist says, I don't believe, is different from I believe, well, he, all he's showing is that he's just a religious fanatic. That's all he's showing. And in science, we say something different. We say, let us assume that God exists. God can only be an assumption. It's in mathematics where a hypothesis is not an assumption. In, in mathematics, a hypothesis is a theory. And, uh, and again, mathematics deals with fact and truth and proof and belief. Okay? And, and, and it turns out that existence has absolutely nothing to do with belief or with disbelief, non-belief, any of those skepticism. Science, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, say, uh, mathematical physics uh, believes that this is this is their rationale you know and this is what this is what they believe in okay and so yeah we we try to separate mathematics from science and the problem is that in mathematics they harp on belief they they call those proofs uh truths and uh you know evidence all that has to do with belief none of that has anything at all to do with science or with, especially with physics okay okay so uh fellow says, I think, yeah, uh, I think it's the same fellow. He continues, he says, that, uh, that's, yeah, meaning God, right? That's not a theory, correct? Theory in science has to be testable and falsifiable. <laughs> what, a theory has to be testable and falsifiable. No, not in science, if anything, in religion, because falsifiable means you're going to approve, you're going to try to convince someone to change his mind. You're working on the belief side of the equation, you can say, and that belongs strictly to religion. It has nothing to do with science. In science, we don't believe. In science, we explain so that someone understands, and that's objectively. Once you understood, we part companies. One goes to his church, the other guy to his church, and they believe whatever they want to believe. They can do research, they can do experiments, they can do whatever they want in their dark basements. When they come together again, explain. I, I want your explanation. What caused <laughs> the spoon to fall to the floor? That's what I need to find out. You need to explain. And you say, well, I did a million experiments. I did repeatability, and, and I measured, and I got all this equation. Yeah, so far you haven't explained anything. So no, we don't care about falsification because uh, one guy falsifies the other guy's God. That's all we're doing with falsification. I don't like your God, so I falsified him. He's not truth to me. He's, he's fake. And the other guy says exactly the same thing. In fact, you could be talking to a mirror for all you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, he said, God is a theory. It's a hypothesis. But he says a hypothesis, but the question is whether this fellow understands what a hypothesis is because the mathematicians, everybody out there, 
considers a hypothesis a theory. It's a, uh, a theory that's in its infancy, so infancy, so so to speak. So that's a theory. A theory, nonetheless. That's not what a hypothesis is. Hypothesis is an assumption. Okay, and that's got nothing to do with theory. Uh, assumptions include the objects that you're going to use in your theory, the definitions, hopefully not from the devil, okay, from the ordinary dictionary or from the encyclopedias out there, especially those scientific ones, which essentially copy everything from the ordinary dictionary, especially the keywords that I mentioned earlier. And, um, and yes, yeah, so, uh, what you need to do is define, and then the next thing you do, uh, part of the hypothesis, is you make a statement of the facts. Nobody knows the facts. Only Mother Nature, Father Universe, God, the devil, those guys know it, but they have it in their file cabinet. But we have no access to the file cabinet. All we can do is make a statement of the facts, what we think happened. You know, someone might say, well, I was at the crime scene. I saw how this guy killed that woman. And everybody who came later on, we don't know what happened. We have to rely on his word. He said, it's a fact. I was here. I saw it. Yeah, I don't believe you. <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> Period. You know, I mean, it's just his opinion. We can't reproduce the fact again. Even if you filmed it, you know, say that was staged. Like a lot of this, these Moonies say, everything's staged. So, you know, uh, facts are, are just beliefs. That's all they are. So we do not have facts in science. What we have is statements of the facts. We make an assumption that this is what happened. And on that assumption of that process, we build our theory. And we say, this is what caused it to happen. This is, this is the physical interpretation of what happened for the purposes of physics, right? So he says, don't get confused like uh, many do with what's called a theory in everyday language and what's a theory regarding to science. Don't pay, play semantics. Yeah, I think this fellow is playing semantics because he doesn't understand what a theory is or what a hypothesis is. Okay, the, that's what we need to clarify. Okay, but getting back to the word belief. Here we have two gentlemen. They did their best. They used their, their maximum brain power uh, to come up with a definition for the word exist, and they never could. Why? Because they, um, they use the C-touch criteria. And when you use C-touch for either what a thing is, what an object is, and for the word exist, you're going to be wrong every time. You won't be able to use it consistently. Meaning the, uh, any, any definition of those two words that depends on C and touch is, by definition, irrational. And we're going to get to the definition of definitions, right? But the key issue here is the following. Here we have it. We have these two gentlemen. One is uh, David Hume. And he says the following, He's, this is in the 18th century, okay? The idea of existence then is, very, is the very same with the idea of what we conceive to be existent, okay? That idea, when conjoined with the idea of any object, makes no addition to it. So uh, Hume was not able to tell the difference between an object and its existence. So he thought the word object and existence, in essence, were synonyms. He couldn't tell the difference. And a few years later, we have Kant, a uh, German guy, and he came up with the same notion. He says, by whatever and however many predicates I may think a thing even in uh, completely determining it, nothing really is uh, added to it if I add that the thing exists. So these two gentlemen, they broke their heads, and they called themselves philosophers, and they were none of the kind. They were just uh, amateurs. Uh, not even philosophers, they, they, they didn't do philosophy. Philosophy is something else. So all these people like uh, Kant and Hume, you know, they, uh, they, they would be kicked out of philosophy, out of genuine philosophy. No, they had no idea. And the fact that they dealt with the word exist also shows that they're not philosophers. Because exist belongs, the word exist, belongs exclusively to physics. Physics is a science of existence. Physics deals with what exists. Physics tries to determine what exists out there, especially in our invisible world of Mother Nature and Father Universe, right? We're trying to figure out what exists out there, what is there, and that's causing all these phenomena, you know, such as the spoon falling to the floor. If you're going to uh, try to explain that, you got to figure out what invisible things are out there first before you can give an explanation. Okay, it's no use saying, well, I measured the, the speed of the uh, uh, fall of the, uh, of the spoon. And I measured how much mass the uh, spoon has and blah, blah, blah. You go with all this stuff and it fell with so much energy and this was the field that was out there. You can go with all those numbers and it's absolutely useless. You need to tell me what physical entity came in contact with a spoon. And if you say, well, I can't see or touch anything, well, maybe you're using the wrong definition for what an object is and what exists means. Okay, so that's where we have to start. Because if an object is not that which you can see or touch, if exist has nothing to do with see or touch, okay, then maybe what's there 
is an object and again it has nothing to do with being able to see it or touch it you can't see the air for sure so uh why would uh, in anything made out of atoms hopefully is a thing okay so air is a thing whether you like it or not so we call it an object and that sounds terrible in the ears of many people because they're bringing these notions from ordinary speech of what an object is in ordinary speech in our everyday um, living you know we touch things we see things and we say okay an object like a table is what i can see and touch and no, you can't use that definition in science. You can't use it in physics because, you know, I can imagine a table and that table you cannot see or touch. And certainly you cannot touch the table that's on the other side of the universe, which is a table anyways. It's the one a Klingon is sitting on. You can't see or touch it. So does that mean that's not an object? Does the word table refer to an object? Does the word chair always refer to an object? So we have to divide every word in the dictionary between objects and concepts. Objects, those which have shape, concepts. Well, that's a little trickier, and that's, uh, I showed it at the beginning here real briefly, but it's a word that invokes two objects. You need to define the word object first before you define the word concept. Okay, okay and uh, so as a consequence, these are the, the definitions we have of this uh, word exist today because people like Hume and Kant, you know, they, they were the ones who addressed it. Okay, they did the best they could, okay? They did a lousy job, but they did the best they could, right? And this is what we have today. If you look it up, you know, you find these circular arguments or circular, circular definitions. Object see, touch, you know, that's the notion people have. Existence is also see, touch, that which you can see and touch. So today we have no difference still between object and existence. You get the common man out there, the layman, and he's going to say, yeah, an object is that which I can see and touch. That's probably what he's going to say. Others say it's a collection of matter, and they don't realize that a collection of whatever, first is a concept, uh, but uh, it's not an object, a collection of something, you know. Uh, uh, but uh, if you have a collection of matter then your matter is already a collection of objects that's what matter is so all you're doing is having a circular definition but then you have you know exist again does it exist well there are objects that don't exist and there are objects and that's what people have trouble with you know you need location for it to exist that's the difference between object and exist anyways here you see the definition you'll find out there you can look them up yourself existence the fact or state of having objective reality uh wikipedia says existence the ability of an entity to what interact touch see touch you know with reality okay what is reality you look it up exist what is actuality exist <laughs> existence the state of or fact of existing that's what you find in a dictionary and uh, then you also find exist to have actual being and you look at being and it's the fact of existing so we've learned a lot there you know a bunch of synonyms so yeah this was this was done by the devil Keep that in mind, okay? So double working is putting his tail in here in, in the dictionary. So whenever you look for a word, a definition for, of a word, never, never go to the dictionary. Not if you're doing science. If you're going to do for ordinary talk, that's fine. But if you're doing science, if you're doing physics, there's only one way. And that's go back to your dark basement, you know, cl close all the doors, shut out the lights, get two beers, and think. you got to break your brains. And think, what is the, the scientific definition? How can I use this word consistently? And once you do that, you have a set of powerful words that allow you to trash anyone, especially mathematicians. Okay, okay so what do we have today as a result that nobody has defined the word exists? Well, we have the, the three stooges. We have the uh, uh, atheists, the deists, and the agnostics. And all these people talk about the belief in existence okay here you have them okay uh mo says i believe in existence larry says i don't believe in existence oh and curly says i don't know whether to believe in existence or not those are the three stooges of religion okay and um how do we do it in science well we do it a little differently here it is okay you say let us assume so and so exists okay so if you're going to talk about god you say let us assume god exists then you can use that assumption that hypothesis for anything you want, okay? And what do you mean when you say, let us assume that God exists? You are saying that God has location, okay? What does that mean? That means that God is first an object. He's gotta be an object. And I'll say he, maybe it's a she. I'll, we can call it an A, we'll just use God, the word God. God has to be an object. If God is a concept, like love or intelligence, concepts cannot be said to exist because exist belongs exclusively to physics. Phys physics deals with objects, not with concepts treated as objects. You know, you can't say God is love and then say God moved over the face of the waters or, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Or, you know, God is a field and it vibrates, you know, we don't accept that kind of thing. Now, you can't sneak it in there. 
it's got to be an object, a genuine object. It's got to have shape, standalone shape. It's got to be a standalone object. Okay. And uh, once you have that, yeah, no problem. Uh, once you have an object, you can say it exists let, or let us assume it exists. Let us assume this star over there in the universe exists. Okay. You can start like that. No problem at all. And then you do tell your theory. Okay. Well, what are you going to tell us about the star? What explanation are you going to give us? Okay. Okay, so what is the scientific definition of the word exist? Well, here we have it. Exist, physical presence. That's the correct definition. That's a scientific, not correct, because you may not agree, but we don't care if you agree. Uh, the only way to challenge that is to come up with your own definition that comes up against it. What are we saying? That's an object that has location. So again, if God wants to exist, God has to have distance with respect to every object in the universe. There better be a straight line of direction from me to God. Okay? God can hide, again, in the 10th dimension, or, I'm sorry, string theory, 26th dimension. He can hide in the 27th dimension for all I care. There's got to be a straight line of direction from me to him. He can't away, no matter, no matter where he goes. Okay, so sorry, God. You want to exist? You got to have distance. Okay, that's, that's the way it is. Separation. Okay, so we have these definitions, uh, and here... We see uh, just a clarification of something okay, that um, a lot of people confuse science with materialism, physics with materialism, especially that. Uh, especially deists uh, accuse uh, many mathematical physicists saying, oh, you're a materialist. It turns out that they're not. You know, and here you see why. These definitions come from the Wikipedia. Materialism holds that the only things that exist are matter and energy. Well, we have no problem with matter. We say that objects that exist are matter, but we do have a big problem with energy. No such monster is energy, not in physics. It's a concept, and we cannot say that energy exists. So if that's the definition of materialism, okay, um, then it's not what we have in science. It's not what we have in physics. Okay, So materialism, under that notion, that definition, is divorced from physics. Okay. If they would have stopped that matter, that would have been okay. Okay, and the idealism holds that the only things that exist are thoughts and ideas. Well, obviously not. Not under physics, uh, we uh, reject that. Thoughts and ideas are concepts, and concepts cannot be said to exist. Not in science. Not in physics. You can say that at the church. You know, in in your Sunday school, no problem. Scholasticism: existence of a thing is not derived from its essence, but is determined by the creative volition of God. My God. Yeah, they have all these notions out there, different people who believe different things. That's why I forget about facts. Uh, fact is what you believe in. That's what it is. How do we say it? What is rationalism? What is rational in, um, in science and physics? Well, here we have a definition that uh, opposes materialism. And it's physics holds that energy is a concept. Therefore, in science, it is irrational to say that a concept exists. And likewise, it is irrational to say that concepts such as thoughts and ideas exist. Okay, so this is... The answer to that. Okay, um, some people uh, say, hey, Bill, how about your threads? Because some people have raised this issue. And they say, your threads, uh, is there a single thread in the universe? And I say, yes, as far as I know, or as far as the hypothesis goes, there's a single thread. There could be another universe made of a parallel thread, another thread that's, you know, not connected to any of the atoms of our, in other words, uh, every atom in the universe and the ropes that interconnect them under the rope hypothesis, all that's wound by a single, all that's weaved by a single thread. We're saying there's a single thread in the, uni in the entire universe and that underlies all matter, okay? That's the foundation, that's the hypothesis, that's the assumption, okay? And from there, we build these theories based on how the atom works, how gravity works, and so on. But there's a single thread. If we could unwind every atom, if we could unwind every rope in the universe, if we had the power of God to do that, right? Uh, then we would end up with a single thread, closed loop thread. Okay, that's that's the notion that we have. So people say, okay, you have a single thread. Okay, you can think of it as a maybe like a rubber band. Okay, something like this. Okay, that's it. That's what we're saying we have out there. That's how complicated the universe is. Okay, so now you know. And so the people say, okay, you have a single thread, but that single thread has no location because it has no reference. It has no distance with respect to anything outside of it. And that's absolutely correct. Now, we could have this situation here. Let me show you, okay? We could have a second thread out there. Our universe is the one on the right. The other one's the one on the left, okay? So there could be a universe out there with all the atoms made up by one thread, and we have our universe with all the atoms and ropes made by our thread, right? There could be a difference in um, the speed of light because maybe there's more matter over there. Maybe uh, that's a f the speed of light may be a function in the ultimately of how long the thread is, 
you know, and maybe they have a different length of this thread, and so they might have a different uh, speed of light over there. But certainly we would not capture any of the light from that universe because no atom in that universe is connected through electromagnetic threads to any of the atoms in our universe. The only way we can see or touch is through atoms. In other words, through atoms, through the rope, to atom, to another rope, and so on. If none of the atoms in that universe are connected to the ones in our universe, we have no connection to that universe. Now, meanwhile, does our universe exist? We have to follow the definition. Whenever in trouble, whenever you don't know, whenever you have you know, a blank in your mind, just follow the definition. People don't understand that. They, they give lip service to the definition. They say, oh, how about this and how about that? Follow the definition. If you follow the definition, I promise you that you will not get hurt. Okay? Just follow the definition. What is the definition? It says that you need an object and you need location. What is location? Set of distances. Here we have no. Here we have def, uh, distance between those two threads. Therefore, both of those threads exist by definition, scientific definition, not the one of ordinary speech, not the notion of ordinary speech. They exist by definition. There's you have objects and you have distance. Okay, so far so good. Okay, now what happens if we have this situation? Okay, okay now in this case we have only a single thread. Now we don't have that other, that other thread to have dis, distance with respect to it, okay? So now we seem to be in a, in a lot of trouble because, you know, people say, well, hold it. Our thread, it's the only thread in the universe, right? Space and thread, that's all we have. And it turns out that this thread makes up everything that exists. And what are you telling me? That everything that exists is based on something that doesn't exist? Is that what you're saying? You know, so and the issue here is, again, people are reverting to ordinary speech, that's the whole problem here. The whole problem is people are thinking again. They're using language of ordinary speech. They're thinking and see touch again. And they're saying, hold it. We can see and touch everything in our universe. That exists. And you're saying this one we can't see or touch. It has no distance. So it doesn't exist. And, and it makes up everything that exists. Yes, you have to go by the definition. Just go by the definition. And I promise not to hurt you. Just go by the definition. The definition says that it has to be an object. Okay, it's got to have distance. If it doesn't have distance with respect to another thread, another universe, then it doesn't exist by definition, pursuant to the definition. Okay, so it is a meaningless, it's a trivial thing in physics because what we use in physics every day are atoms. And we are saying this atom exists because it has distance with respect to this other atom. Okay, and we can go around with everything that's, that is out there, all the atoms. You can even say the rope exists because there is a distance between ropes, even though we don't measure between ropes, we measure between atoms. And so we have the notion that distance is only between atoms. So the distance between atoms is essentially the length of the rope. And we do not think in terms of, oh, the distance between two energies, which is what people imagine light to be. You know, what kind of answer is that, saying that you have a distance between two energies? Nobody would talk like that. And the same thing here. Here we have a distance, a separation between ropes. So it does have existence in that sense. But we never think of energy, which is what people think the rope is, uh, in terms of existence, in terms of distance, okay? In terms of location. That's the problem. But whenever people say, oh, but the thread doesn't exist because it's a single thread and there's no distance to any other thread outside of it, yeah, it's a trivial issue. Just follow the definition and you can safely say that the single thread that makes up all the matter in the universe, that thread doesn't exist. That does not mean, that does not entail that the atoms of which it's, that are made of that thread do not exist.